I was 13 years old when I was gang raped by two men. And very much on that night, I left my body. It felt like I was never present within my body for many, many years. I was just this, like I was renting an empty house that had no furniture in. So I always felt like a, an empty vessel. So my healing has always been about getting back in and connecting back to myself because I was kicked out for years. Madeline, tell us what stage in your life did you find yourself? What relationship broke you to find yourself? Which relationship broke me? Mm, that's a very interesting question. I guess it was a relationship with myself, really, because I have come from a place of trauma. And so I've always kind of really... Um, wanted to learn to be okay with what had happened with me to to realize that I wasn't the trauma that happened to me and to I guess land back in my body and get all my memories back to make me whole again to make me um I guess line up because I always felt that I was operating very differently in my head and my body never felt connected if that makes sense so I always wanted to synchronize myself to align myself up so yeah the, that's the biggest relationship I've been working on is myself. And for the benefit of our audience could you expand on why you had to build that relationship with yourself again? Oh. Yes yeah, so and my story is one of sexual violence. I was 13 years old when I was gang raped by two men and very much on that night, I left my body. I'm now a psychotherapist, so I know it's really normal in times of extreme trauma that we get out of the way. But for me, it felt like I was never present within my body for many, many years. I was just this, like I was renting an empty house that had no furniture in. So I always felt like a, an empty vessel. So my healing has always been about getting back in and connecting back to myself because I was kicked out for years. And before you were sexually raped, um, may I ask you, what was your relationship like with your parents and your siblings beforehand? Yeah, it was okay. I'm one in the middle. I'm one of five. So I think middle middles always have an interesting uh, placement. Uh, things were a little bit tough at home because my mum was unwell. She was bedridden for many years. But before that, it was good, you know, just a big family and had lots of pets, had a great mum and dad. Both of them had had their own difficulties in life and showed us that actually you can get through anything. So, yeah, they were good, good teachers for me. And what about uh, adolescence life when you went to school? Did you make friends easily did you, or did you find it hard to make friends? I was always a little bit shy, I think, but I liked school. It was a good um, escapism for me, I think. Uh, after I experienced my trauma, I couldn't focus on studying because, you know, I was 13 and had this immense, huge thing happen to me. But I still really loved the connections with my friends. And, you know, we had a good social life. We went out. We um, did a lot of partying, <laughs> which was, I guess, was a kind of a reflection of what was going on. It was just a way to not deal with what had happened to me, to avoid looking at all. And what about working relationships? Did you, when you left school, did you go out to the workplace? Uh, I did. did when I, yeah, when I left school, I went away for a year. So my first kind of, I guess, working role was uh, on a kibbutz for six months, which was very different to any life I'd ever experienced. Um, getting up very early, but then you've got the rest of the day to be part of this community, sit by the pool, hang out, watch movies, whatever. And then the other half of that year, I worked as a volunteer in a town called Ashkelon in a community arts uh, kind of organisation that used to try to get all the communities together and build, I guess, better relationships because they were from all different parts of the world. So that was like my first kind of, uh, I suppose, introduction to working, even though it was a year of travelling. But it was good. I liked I liked being away. It was away from everything that I thought I'd left behind. So that was good. And yeah, I guess I was like most people. I started off with, you know, Saturday jobs. I was a newspaper girl, uh, hated it on Christmas or whenever, when, you know, Saturdays and Sundays when it got really, really heavy with all the newspapers having to carry that. But it just did Saturday jobs and then 
I went to college, even though it's completely different to what I do now. I trained as a beauty therapist. So for a long time, I worked in salons and then I worked for myself as a freelance makeup artist and hairstylist in like the photography world. So very, very different to where I'm at in my life now. You could have a, you could have me as a hair as a person, <laughs> as a client for hairstyling because of a lot. It hair wouldn't take too long, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. So you mentioned there a few minutes ago that you were gang draped by a number of men. Yeah. Did you not carry any shame, or how did you feel about yourself as a person after that event? I know you worked abroad in the kibbutz for a year or so. Yeah. You then qualified as a beauty therapist. You worked as a hairstylist. Uh, did you feel any shame? Absolutely. Any... Yeah, the shame was debilitating. I was so scared of anybody finding out because I thought incorrectly that they would look at me how I looked at myself. And then I just thought, well, it was my fault that I was guilty. I brought it on myself. But also I thought that I was just contaminated. It had ruined me or broken me in some way that I was a worthless human being. If this could happen to me, I wasn't worth very much. So yeah, I carried shame for so many years and it's taken me a long, long, long time to realise that it wasn't my shame, that, you know, the shame never belonged to me, but it's such an intimate crime that I think is just normal. And also the way that there's so many rape blaming messages out there or victim blaming that I just internalized it and just you know just was terrified of people finding out obviously now this is what I do I speak out and write out about sexual violence really in order to help end that shame for other people because you know I will get people say to me well I liked your post on Instagram or Facebook but I can't like it or comment because then people that I know or in my family will know that I've also been raped and I, and I couldn't face them knowing. So as a society, we carry so much shame as well. And it, it was never, ever my shame. It always belonged to them. And may I ask, you know, you were 13 years of age when you were raped. Uh, yeah. What support services were there when you approached the police service, for example, or your GP uh, yeah. to talk about this and to report the incident? Were they forthcoming in terms of support? Or did they make you feel, you know, even more guilty about what happened to you? Well, I decided not to report it because then I was believing all the things that my head was telling me that I would get into trouble, you know, because we'd met boys. We both lied about where we were staying, me and my friend, and we'd bought alcohol. And also one of the very last things that one of them said to me, the one that I call the worst one, was that if I speak about it in any way that he would find me and he would kill me. And they were very, very violent. And after some of the things that he had done to me, I believed him. So I have never reported it. And I didn't go for any support straight away, which I don't recommend. If, if you do know anyone that's happened to anyone that's listening or it's happened to you, I think now on reflection, I don't like to have regret because we do the journey we do. But I think now if I could go back and tell my 13 year old self, I would say, get help a lot quicker because it took me many years to tell my parents. I was about 16, 17, and I didn't really go for support till I was much older. I was placed in a hospital because I attempted suicide after it happened, but nobody ever really supported me around that because I, I couldn't find my voice. I couldn't speak about it. And no one ever really um, assumed or guessed what had happened to me. They just treated me for an eating disorder and depression. So my time in there, it was hidden again, you know, I buried it deep. So it took me a long time to find someone to speak to. And it took me many attempts of different kinds of therapists for me to feel, I guess, safe enough to trust them. So I would say I was in my mid twenties, really, when I first started to look for help. Yeah. May I ask, how did you manage to suppress your inner feelings for such a long time? Yeah. Uh, because they often say that you know, your mom is a very intuitive person and nobody knows it better than your mom, for example. Yeah. So how did you manage to suppress these feelings and keep that truth within yourself for so yeah. long? Well, I don't think I really did because, you know, it has to come out of you and somehow. So I was becoming very rebellious. I was using a lot of drugs and alcohol. I was partying hard. I was doing the opposite of what my parents said. I was arguing. I didn't really speak. I wasn't eating. So I do believe that, you know, what we can't verbalise it's got to come out somehow, you know, it's got to come out of our bodies. So my mum, you know, I've had conversations with her now, 
knew, always knew that something was the matter. She always knew something was wrong, but I couldn't obviously say it to her. So they took me to see a therapist and they said, well, we can't work with her because she won't speak because I was really just refused to speak because of the fear of, you know, anything slipping up. So I think my mum went to him and she learned how best to deal with me. But yeah, it wasn't really their fault. I just had shut down, uh, you know, completely shut down and numbed out and just depressed it inside of me. So I wouldn't really say that I coped very well with hiding what was going on, but they just knew my behaviour was off, but they didn't know why. That's very interesting. So in terms of, you know, relationships with men, did you find it, you know, difficult to go out there to uh, nightclubs, to party, to yeah. meet men, to have, you know, a relationship? Yeah, well, then obviously I had a huge fear around men. I didn't trust men at all, but also one of the many side effects that women or men can have after being raped is I became very promiscuous. But now I know it was from a place of fear and also from my place of well this is all I'm good for you know my worthlessness so um I used to think well if somebody tried it on if I fought back which is what I did the very first time and it got very violent then it would get violent again so I would just let men do whatever they wanted so it was a horrible time for me because I was totally disconnected from my body when all this was going on but luckily, when I was 17, when I was in Israel, uh, nearly 40 years ago, actually this year be 40 years, 40 years next month, I met my husband of nearly 35 years. So that changed everything for me. That was amazing. Something inside of me just knew. Luckily, I listened to my gut that I could trust him and I knew he would be safe and he would never harm me and... 40 years later, I can still say that I made the right decision. And it's definitely, yeah, he's he really, I think, was an angel sent to save me because I don't know what would have happened to me if I hadn't met Stephen. So, I'm yeah. I'm for you. And you're still married 35 years later. Yeah, so, yes. You know, well done to you for such a traumatic uh, adolescence. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, fair play to you. So in terms of did you start a family and would you be very protective of your children, for example? Yeah, well, you know, initially I had so many fears, mainly, as I said, being around men, my safety and being out of control. I told Stephen that I was never going to become a mum and, and he was OK. You know, he married me anyway. But I suddenly thought to myself, you know, they're going to win if I make that decision permanently. If I don't ever become a mum, I'm giving all of my power to them. And actually, they, they don't even have any idea that I'm doing that. So I always call it my best revenge. I came up with this plan that I was going to become a mum, which is when really I started to go into therapy and to deepen my relationship with my past and myself, because I thought, I, I don't want this holding, hanging over me forever. I want to really get to a place where I'm okay with it. And so I went on to have three daughters. So obviously I got past my fear of becoming a mum and thankfully I have three gorgeous girls. Um, and yes, yeah, so for the for a long time, I was very protective over them, you know, and I was very scared, mainly due to my my own past. But then I also saw I had the potential to corrupt their minds. I want them to have a relationship based on their own experiences, not based on my experiences. And I thought if I'm not careful, I could transfer a lot of my fears and paranoid thoughts into them. So I had to find a way to relax and let them live their life you know I wanted them to be um, spontaneous happy well adjusted have no fears confident women so you know they are that so <laughs> it's good and it's bad but um, yeah I just thought I have to let them live their life I can't wrap them up in cotton wool which is what my instinct was telling me if, if I had my way I'd never let them out of the house but thankfully I now have one who's married one who is now living with her boyfriend my youngest one is traveling so they're all they're all good and I've never passed my fears onto them in any way so that was that was a good huge relief but we don't see what we're doing until we see it and then it became very obvious and once I saw that I thought I have to you know do mothering in a different way so I changed how I mothered. Yeah you mentioned about being uh, trying to avoid being over overprotective of your children mm -hmm. Was it one of your wishes in life, for example, that your children would go to university and get a good education, 
get established in a good profession, yeah. for example. Yeah, you know, I just really want them to choose a career or something that they love doing and then they'll be really happy, whether university was part of that or not. I just always want them to be happy in life. I mean, I think as a, a mum, that's all I ever wanted. I think I'm only ever as happy as my unhappiest child. So, you know, if any of them have got any issues and that obviously affects me. So I just always just say, you follow your heart, you do what you want to do, choose whatever profession you want to be in and we'll just support you all the way. So, and they have, they're all doing really good. Good stuff. And when your children, your three daughters reached, uh, say, teenage years and they wanted to go out there to discos uh, with their friends from school, for example, did you feel any apprehension within yourself when they asked that question? (laughs) Yeah, of course, because obviously of what had happened to me, but I was always um, very clear with them. I had some ground rules, you know, just if you leave your drink at the bar and you go to the loo, don't drink it again in case it's been spiked or if anything happens and you're scared, whatever, just call me or dad and we'll always come and pick you up. You know, I I know that they're teenagers. They're going to try and drink. They're going to try drugs at one point in their life. I'm not naive. And, And so they did. They've always called me if ever things they felt they were too drunk or it was out of control or whatever. And we've just come and got them. And now they're just, you know, sensible, older, older young women that want to go to bed early and go to the gym. So, yeah, but of course, I think most mums or parents would worry when their kids start to go out and wait up for them. I think that's quite normal. Uh, by the time I got to the third one, I just see her shoes were down there in the hall in the morning. So I've obviously stopped waiting up for them. So, uh, yeah, it got a lot easier the more children I had, more relaxed. Well on to you. Looking back at your past, what mm-hmm. circumstances would you consider as character building blocks that shaped the person you have become today? Yeah, well, obviously, if going through a huge trauma, I would not wish it on anyone. But in some ways, it might sound a bit strange for people, but I wouldn't really now undo what happened to me because... There is a thing called post-traumatic stress, which I obviously had for many years. It was undiagnosed, but I know now that I've definitely experienced that. Uh, But there's also post-traumatic growth. And I think that we can grow through what we go through. And I don't think I would have found out how strong or resilient I was unless I had been through this, um, the dark times. You know, we really can't see the light unless we've really been in the dark definitely I uh, was in a cave for many years with what had happened to me and it's there's always a little glimpse of hope but definitely now I feel like I'm out of that cave and I'm living my life in the light as much as I possibly can so yeah whilst it was massive character building stuff I wouldn't wish it on anyone but it might be hard for people to understand but I, I, I wouldn't take it away now because it has altered and shaped and changed my life actually in in good ways too. I remember having a conversation with a man called Ricky Muttle, and he was a first responder at the Grenfell Tower fire disaster in London there, I think it was Mm -hmm. in 2017. Mm -hmm. And he suffered from PTSD. And I do remember him saying to me that he had to hit rock bottom before he could get effective help. Did you find that yourself? Well, no, because I purposely went to go and get help when I made the decision to become pregnant. I knew that that was a block in my mind. And I knew that if I didn't get past my fear of giving birth or being around men or being out of control, that then I could never become a mum. So I intentionally saw what was blocking me and I went and asked for help. So I don't think I'd reached rock bottom, but I just knew Um, in my heart if I don't do this I'm going to regret this for the rest of my days and I'll be too old then to become a mum so I didn't I didn't want them to win so I guess my stubbornness (laughs) in me as well really helped me to not get to rock bottom to get to that place beforehand when I thought I've got to do this for me for my husband and and for the children that I'll bring into this planet as well. You mentioned there a few minutes ago that you're a psychotherapist by profession Mm -hmm. nowadays So how do you manage to control your emotions when you have clients in your studio or in your room who are talking about 
you know, maybe they were gang raped, for example. So how do you control yeah. your emotions in such in such a situation? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I've actually stopped working as a psychotherapist just at the start of lockdown, but I did it for many, many years. And we have to have supervision. So when we are working one to ones, you have to do, I think it's an hour and a half every month, depending on how many clients you see. So I would do group supervision, which is that was compulsory at the center that I worked in, but I also went for one to one with my supervisor for an hour, an hour and a half every month. And it's really about um, growing your awareness. So if anything comes up for me in the session, if I feel fear or, you know, denial, I have to work out now, is this happening to me because it's mine or is this, am I picking this up from my clients? So I had to learn to, um, recognize what was my own stuff and find a way to put it to the side because otherwise I wouldn't be able to be present enough to do the work so it is a brilliant job because it really kept me very um, present in the chair you know I asked my client to meet me halfway but I've got to be able to meet them as well without any of my own stuff and just because we're not with therapists we all have stuff as well I had to make sure that none of my stuff interfered with the session so it's always about improving your self-awareness, becoming more aware, a better a witness of what belongs to me and what belongs to the client. And it's it's a great job, you know, because it's always working me. Stuff in a client, I've got no idea what they're going to say. It could suddenly trigger me and I have to like, oh, that's hit me with my stuff. And I have to learn to just breathe, connect to it, allow it and just move it to the side so I can be there and do the work for my client. What message do you have for parents you know, whether children have completed their A-levels as it is in the UK or leaving mm-hmm. cert here in Ireland mm-hmm. and their children are going to go off on two-week holiday, for example, to Greece. Mm-hmm. What message do you have for parents in that situation? Tell them to have a good time. <laughs> you know, uh, just that they're going to do whatever they're going to do. Just I think if we can just really always have good communication, you know, then and that's all that matters. My eldest daughter went away to one of these places, Malia or somewhere, and after a week, she hated it. And I said, well, you can come home. You don't need to stay for two weeks. She really is someone that likes to go to bed early, doesn't drink too much, gets up so she can sunbathe. And they were all, you know, drinking. And there had been some incident. And then the landlord where they were renting took their passports away. And it all got very messy. Somebody had peed on a mattress and he wanted money from them. And she just, I said, you can come home. <gasps> okay. And we just arranged for her flight to come back. So I just think... Have good communication. Don't be naive. They're they're there to party. But, you know, it's actually very safe because when they all went away, my girls, like most of their year went away to the same block of apartments. I would hate to be a family that was sandwiched in between all these revelers. (laughs) But, you know, there maybe were a hundred of them on the flight. So they're all there having parties and they all look after each other. And it's just kind of a a rite of passage, really, isn't it? So, Mm. yeah. I just let them live their life and enjoy themselves and have good communication. And one final question for you here. Name one relationship you'd like to have again, given another chance. And what would you do better this time around? Oh, one relation. Well, I guess there's always, um, I want to see people that have passed away. I want to, I would love to see my dad again. You know, he's been passed now. This year is 25 years. So I don't know if I would do anything different. Maybe if I could tell him earlier on what had happened to me. But yeah, oh, you've even made me feel all emotional. <laughs> I don't want to see my dad again, I think, and just have, yeah, one last hug. Oh, well, and this has been a very fascinating interview and intriguing interview today, or conversation, I should say, uh, Madeline. So thank you very much for your time. And good luck with your speaking business. You've thank got a great you. story to tell to people. So onward and upward. Thank you so much, Donna. It's been an absolute pleasure to be on your show. So thank you for inviting me. My mum very much ruled the roost. My my dad did what he t- was told pretty much, except he didn't really. He just So if she was ever not around, we as kids knew we could get away with anything. Um, so even in our teenage times, if mum, my, my sister and I used to smoke when we were out of the house. My bo- Both parents were smokers at that time, but they didn't want us to be. Um, and if my mum caught us, there would be hell to pay. But if my dad caught us, it would be don't tell your mother kind of thing. <laughs> right, so, yeah. yeah. So my mum was very much in charge of the household. <laughs>